My topic today is the theory of profit loss and entrepreneurship. And what I want to do is really to start with your daily lives and show you that there is an element of entrepreneurship in everyday action. And then we'll move on to the business world and talk about the entrepreneur. Um, let me just start with one small quote from von Mises. Mises says that all action is embedded in the flux of time and involves speculation. Okay? Now, he, when he says all action, he means all action. He doesn't just mean business actions, okay? production decisions or investment decisions. Um, he means any action. Now, remember, just being here today is an action, coming to the Mises University. And it involves a speculation on your part. Okay? You have certain expectations of what this is going to turn out to be and how much you'll get from this and whether or not you'll, you'll be happy that you made that decision or, that, or maybe that you'll regret the decision. Uh, you could be doing other things, okay, as, as we'll, we'll talk about a little later. Um, you could be um, just going camping with, with friends or working for an income and so on. So all action always involves, is always aimed at the future, and always involves the exchange of, a less, of what you believe to be a less satisfactory for a more satisfactory state of affairs. So you believe this week... You're, 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 you, you get more you derive more satisfaction from coming to the Mises University and hearing us than you do, let's say, from, wor from, from working, let's say, for um, a, an employer and earning four hundred dollars or something. Okay, which means that all action involves not only time and uncertainty but also costs and benefits. You compare the alternative uses of your time in coming here. So, for example, to be a little bit more concrete, you may rank this first, okay, everyone before they commit resources to anything ranks the expected satisfaction they'll get from using the resources in different ways. So you, so you expect the greatest satisfaction from coming uh, to coming from the Mises or, or from coming to the Mises University, okay, maybe second there's four hundred dollars in wages that you could have earned, the second best use of, of this week of time let's say in, in your mind Third, you could, you could go on a camping trip with friends and so on. Fourth, you could prepare for college, but who wants to do that? Prepare for going back. And so on and so forth. There are many alternative uses of your time, of this week, that would, would yield you satisfaction. So the benefit then, the expected benefit, is the satisfaction that you expect to derive from the action you actually undertake. The cost is not all the other things that you could do with your time, but the next most important use of your time. The next most important use of this week is the $400 in wages. So the opportunity cost of coming to the Mises University, or the true cost of coming to the Mises University, is the foregone opportunity to earn $400. That's why in economics we, we refer to cost as opportunity cost. It's the opportunity you give up to um, derive satisfaction from an alternative use of your resources. In this case, the resources are time. Okay. Um, and this also applies to, let's say, you, you, you receive a sum of money upon graduating from, from college for your, um, from your, let's say, your aunt, okay? And um, say she, she gives you $2,000. And you can use this money in, again, a multitude of different ways, many of which would bring you satisfaction. And let's say that you could go on a cruise in the Caribbean with the $2,000. Okay, that might be first. Or second, you could buy a new PC. Okay, or third, you can just spend it on partying the whole summer okay, before you start working or before you go to graduate school. Or fourth, you could save it for graduate school. So the cost of the cruise is not the $2,000 you paid. That's the price of the cruise. It's not the cost. It's not the economic cost. The little cost of the cruise or the, the economic cost of the cruise is the new PC that you don't purchase, that you're not able to purchase because you use the resources for something that you believe to be more important. Okay? So benefits and costs are completely subjective. When you are determining which, action, which use of resources gives you the most um, satisfaction, you compare cost and benefit. Okay? So everyone, when they choose the highest value use of their resources, assumes that the benefit, or believes that the benefit, what, the, what they're getting, is going to be greater than the cost, what they're giving up. Okay? That's called, at the point of your decision, 
that time period is ex ante. In Latin, it simply means from before. From before the action, everyone believes that benefits exceeds costs. Everyone expects that they will have what we call in economics a psychic profit. Not a monetary profit, but a psychic profit. Meaning, they value what they get with the resources more than what they give up in alternative uses. Now, do people make mistakes? Yeah, because of uncertainty, certainty also implies error. Okay? Every action holds out the possibility of committing an error. And how do we define error in economics? Very simply. You come here, you're bored to tears by some of the, the, the speakers, not me of course, but others. You wish that you had done something else, you wish you had, had continued to work and earn at $400. Okay? So, in that case, the benefit is actually less than the cost. Okay? You've made a mistake. In other words, you wish you had chosen your second alternative. But that's ex post. That's after the action has been completed, looking back, you have a regret. We call that a psychic loss. Now, if you're perfectly happy with your choice, then you've earned a psychic profit. The key here is this. Ex ante, people only believe that they're going to do what? Earn a psychic profit. Otherwise, you wouldn't undertake that action. you do the next thing. Okay? But ex post, either thing can happen. Your benefit could be less than the cost, in which case you lose, or it could be greater than the cost, in which case you have a psychic profit. Okay. In this world, there are people that are better at forecasting and adjusting to the future than other people. Those people tend to be usually happy with their actions. Now, we, we know, all of us know, may have friends or acquaintances who continually make mistakes. Even simple things like make a choice off a menu, right? They pick a, a meal that five minutes later they hate. That's a psychic loss. Okay? They chose, let's say, a, a certain type of, 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 of steak instead of choosing the chicken dish that looked really good. And they regret it okay, five minutes later. So there are many people that make it, or, or you may know people that have gone, I know, uh, uh, met at, at an earlier uh, Mises University, someone who went to three different universities. Okay? They were on their third university, or he was on his third university. Okay? He regretted his choice of the other two universities. Or choosing a major in college. Okay? Some people may choose nursing and they, they, they might come out and find out that, well actually it's the other way around, someone might choose education and find out it's very difficult to find a job. The next, cho the next best use of their time would have been to choose nursing. And they find that there's, nurses are earning high wages, there's a shortage of nurses. So they've invested four years, not just of tuition, but of their time in being trained as, as, as teachers and finding that the wages are much lower than they thought they would be. Uh, and that the wages of nurses are much higher. So they regret that action. Now here's where we move into the business world, okay? Uh, and before I actually move into the business world, let me just sum up all of this up by saying every action has an entrepreneurial element. That is, every action takes time to complete, is therefore aimed at the future, is therefore based on a forecast which is uncertain, okay? Now, so, as I said, some people handle uncertainty better than other people. Some people know how they're going to feel in the future and what, what will bring them satisfaction. Um, they'll be better at, at, at making these forecasts or anticipating how they'll feel in the future and so on. Um, we can, that's really just a datum, okay, or a fact about the real world. Some people are better at forecasting and adjusting their actions to the forecasts of the future than other people. Now, it is those people that tend to be the better forecasts that undertake what Mises calls the job of a promoter entrepreneur. Now, promoter is an older word which means to start a business, to promote a new undertaking or a new project. Okay? We can call them business entrepreneurs if you want. But the term that Mises uses is promoter entrepreneur. The reason why he qualifies entrepreneur is because he wants to distinguish it from everyday entrepreneurship that all of us engage in and taking uh, any action. Okay? He also wants to distinguish it from those people who are labor entrepreneurs, okay? those people who maybe move to another part of the co country because they believe they can get a better or higher paying job. Okay? So there are lab or landlord entrepreneurs or landowner entrepreneurs who use their land for a certain uh, sell, sell their, or uh, rent their land to, to one person instead of another person because they believe over time the rents will be higher. 
Okay, those are also entrepreneurs within the marketplace. But the, the, the driving force of the market economy is the entrepreneur that starts a new business, who has a new idea or the new vision about another product or a better technology. And that's what we're going to focus on now, okay? The business or, or, or promoter entrepreneur. Okay. What is the specific function of, of this entrepreneur? Um, this entrepreneur is the, the, the individual that invests in a new business, okay, or invests in an ongoing business, and then directs the factors of production, meaning land, labor, and capital goods. Okay. He or she is the one that, may, that decides how to combine these factors of production, what product to produce, how much of the product to produce, what technology to use, that is how to produce the product, where to locate the, the site of production, and so on. They make all of those uh, important decisions. Now, in making those decisions, they, are, they advance capital. Or, or, or their savings, okay, or borrowed savings in addition to their own savings, they advance those savings, that money, to the laborers in the form of wages, to the landowners in the form of rents, okay, to um, other capitalists that they're buying the capital goods from. So they pay in advance of the product being produced. So, for example, if you have someone who's, who's, who's coming up with a new um, idea for an automobile, okay, let's say a hybrid automobile that runs on both gas and, um, and electricity, or something like that, or in gas and ethanol, and um, that might take five years. In the interim, they're investing money in developing this automobile, and they, they bring it to market five years later. Now, during that five years, all the factors of production have been paid in advance. So who's left with either the loss or the profit? The entrepreneur. So in economics, we always point out that the entrepreneur is the ultimate decision maker makes the ultimate decisions about the factors of production, but also is the sole risk bearer. Whether this car fails on the market or turns a huge profit, the laborers during those five years when were involved in the research and development and the production, they all get paid. They get paid every two weeks or every month by the entrepreneur. They don't bear any risk for the success or failure of that automobile. The entrepreneur and his capitalist partners bear all the risk. So anyone who invests in a, invests in a business okay, is an entrepreneur. Some of them are the more active entrepreneurs, they're the promoter entrepreneurs. Others might be the silent partners that or the venture capitalists that advance the capital. The capital. They still are entrepreneurs. Okay. Anyone, again, who risks their capital is an entrepreneur. Now, what's, what's their, their primary pr job? Okay. Their primary job is to anticipate future market conditions and then to act accordingly, to produce those things that they believe will turn a profit and to avoid producing those things that will result in losses. So in order to do that, I'm going to introduce another word here, entrepreneurs must be able to not only be forecasters, they must also appraise future prices. So they must forecast future market conditions. What is the market for automobiles going to look like in five years? Okay. But they also must turn these forecasts, these ideas about what consumers will want, what other producers will be, will be um, um, bringing to market in five years, they must turn all of that qualitative information into quantitative information. They must appraise, okay, that is appraising the value of something, they must appraise the prices of their product. Or let's say appraise future prices. Now, they know what the prices of automobiles are today. And that's helpful to some extent. But are the prices of automobiles today relevant to the market for, for, for five years from now? No. Okay. What they have to do then is to Based on the information they have today and their understanding of the future, they have to come, come up with some idea about what the price is going to be five years down the road. Now, not all businesses, not all new ideas take five years to come to fruition. Some ideas might take six months or three months. Still, it's a future market, and appraise, appraisement of future prices is always involved in, 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 in um, entrepreneurship. That's the most important um, 
activity that the entrepreneur must undertake. If he's correct, he'll earn profit because he'll know how much to spend on the factors of production. He knows how high he can bid or, or, or what his costs can be okay, in order to turn a profit. And we'll get back to profit and loss in a moment. Um, and let me just give you some concrete examples about all this. Um, let's take IBM. In 1960s, the 1960s and 1970s, the uh, word uh, IBM was synonymous with the word computer. Right? IBM was the largest, most dominant uh, computer uh, producer in the world. Okay, not just in the U.S., but in the world. And IBM came up, believe it or not, with the PC technology. But the president at the time of IBM, I believe his name was Watson, said, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna pursue this technology. We're not gonna develop it into a commercial product because this is really just gonna be a toy for households. In other words, kids are gonna play games on these things. He did not foresee or forecast any business use for this new technology. So the, the person who owns profits isn't necessarily the person who comes up with the new technology. It's the person who understands the commercial prospects for that new technology and then acts to, a, to adapt it into a product that he can sell or she can sell to consumers. Now, what did, what did Stephen Jobs do? He was the, the person that started Apple. Um, he had a partner. But uh, he started in his own garage. He didn't have much capital. Okay? He, came up, he came up with a, you know, a, a sort of a small personal use computer called an Apple. And made a great deal of money initially doing that, okay. And then others, other companies, Compaq and um, uh, who were some of the earlier companies. Some of them have since gone out of business. But there were a number of computer companies that began to develop and market PCs in the early '80s. And 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 IBM fell behind. They continued to focus. Now they began to produce them, but they continued to focus on mainframes. Okay. They continued to believe that businesses were going to were going to use mainframes. Um, but over time, by, by 1990, these investment decisions made in the early 80s, based on, on these erroneous forecasts, turned out to be completely wrong. Because in 1992 and 1993, IBM lost, in those two years together, $13 billion. Okay? In two years, they lost $13 billion, the most money ever lost by uh, an industrial corporation. That's since been exceeded by the losses at WorldCom and, and Enron and, and, and the many of the telecommunications firms, Adelphia and so on, have gone bankrupt. So in the 90s we had um, uh, an over-optimism about, about uh, you know, the uses of fiber optics and so on. And many, uh, many of these telecommunications firms, um, so, so it's not only missing a new trend, but the other error you can make is, is, is to believe that something is going to be more successful than, than it really is. So you had these huge companies, Lucent and so on, losing tremendous amounts of money. Okay. Now IBM eventually readjusted, okay, but, but they're no longer a leading company okay, because of these errors that were made in the 1980s. They also didn't um, market their software and, and, and gave some of the technology away or sold it, licensed it to Bill Gates and Microsoft became the big software producer. Okay? That was another mistake that, 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 that IBM made. So no matter how big and powerful and successful a co company has been in the past, as we'll see, that does not bear on the future. Okay? Companies that, that are successful in the past may very well suddenly make entrepreneurial errors that affect their position in the market um, in the future. Okay, and then IBM certainly did that. Same thing with US auto producers. Okay? When the price of gas initially rose from something like 30 cents a gallon in 1970 all the way up to a you know, dollar thirty a gallon by 1979, um, US auto producers, the big three that were extremely successful in, in, in the US, uh, Chrysler, GM, and Ford, in the 1950s and 1960s, suddenly began to lose money in the early 1980s. And the reason why was because the Japanese producers were much more insightful about what the future held. American companies believed that, well, the American government will, will ensure that prices will go back down to what they were in the early 70s. And even if they don't, Americans will never give up their, 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 their large, powerful, comfortable cars. Okay? But in fact, in the early 80s, Japanese producers who were used to high prices, Japan's prices were up around 250 during, uh, per gallon during the 1970s, um, 
they began to aggressively market compact and subcompact cars in the U.S. And the demand for these cars, um, in fact, what was there? As Americans experienced higher gas prices, they did want to downsize their automobiles. So the big three in 1980 and 1981 lost, some, lost together something like $5 billion. And once again, they began to readjust by producing smaller cars as the 80s wore on. Now, initially, these cars were lower quality than the Japanese cars. But eventually, after 10 years, they, they, you know, by the 1990s, they were competing with, with the Japanese automobiles. But they never reestablished their position in the market again because of those entrepreneurial errors. Okay, at least not, they didn't reestablish a domination of the market, uh, of the U.S. market. Okay. Now, let me just say a few things uh, about the, uh, a few other things about the entrepreneur before we go on to talk about profits and managers. Um, Remember, the entrepreneur must own some capital. Okay? Some economists say that you can have a pure entrepreneur who just has this good idea about what to produce, and they liken entrepreneurship to all these $10 bills are floating down in, the, um, in this room. But only a few of us are alert enough to see them, and it's those people who are the entrepreneurs, and we, we reach out and grab them. So. So profit opportunities in this, according to this view, which is not Mises' view, it's, it's Israel Kirzner's view, uh, profit opportunities are like free $10 bills, okay? That is, you buy things at a lower cost and you sell them at a higher cost somewhere else. In other words, you immediately see the profit opportunity. But that's not um, what Mises believed, okay, and what, what most Austrians believe. Most Austrians believe that it involves speculation and uncertainty, that you don't know what the prices are in the future. You don't know if those $10 bills are going to be there. Okay? And you can easily make mistakes. So all entrepreneurs are not pure in the sense that they're only entrepreneurs. They're, they're, they're usually capitalists, almost always capitalist entrepreneurs. They have to have some of their own capital. Now, they can go and borrow additional capital and expand their business if they're successful. Okay? So um, entrepreneurs are owners of capital, and they risk that capital when they invest it in a project. Because, again, the project, the success of the project is only going to be known months or years in the future when conditions have changed. And if they haven't correctly anticipated these conditions, they're going to lose money. Um, I also, as I pointed out before, the entrepreneur is the sole bearer, bearer of risk in production. IBM, or the stockholders in IBM, lost that $13 billion. The workers in IBM, they got paid all during the 80s, all during the time they were building these, these mainframe computers that were wasting scarce resources. Because when the computers were sold on the market, maybe a mainframe was, the cost was $3 million for a, main, a large mainframe computer. The price is only $2.2 million. Let's, so they lost $800,000 on every computer that they, they, they sold, okay, once they were produced. Again, the workers got paid the full wage. They never lost any money. Now, after the computers came out and they realized that these mainframes um, were not what consumers wanted. They did fire some of the workers. But that, that has nothing to do with bearing the risk for the, the mistake in the past. The workers did not bear the, the risk for, 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 for the good that they're, they're involved in producing. And finally, um, we call the um, entrepreneur sometimes the residual claimant. Residual meaning the entrepreneur gets what's left over after all costs have been paid. So the entrepreneur has a, has a claim on the profit, if there's a monetary profit, or the loss. Okay. So if you've invested $100 million in a certain um, uh, investment project, and you can sell the output for $120 million, then that means the factors get $100 million, and you get what's left over. You get the $20 million that's left over. If, on the other hand, you sell the product, or the output of this project, for $80 million, then the factors have been paid $100 million, in, uh, dollars, that's your capital, and you're left with a loss of $20 million in your capital. Okay? So you're, the reason, you're, you're left with what's left, you get what's left over as the entrepreneur. Okay, now let's just talk about, a little bit about the managers, because people confuse managers and entrepreneurs. Hey, what is the job of the manager? Even a very high-level manager, the CEO. Okay, it's the entrepreneurs that's, that set up the general plan for, for the firm, 
what to produce, how to produce, um, meaning what technology to use, where to, where to locate the firm, and so on, or the plant. They make all those decisions. Okay? But they can't be everywhere all the time. They're not omnipresent, meaning they're not everywhere, especially with multinational firms. Well, take Bill Gates. You know, his Microsoft sp is spread out all over the world. He can't be everywhere. So he has to hire managers okay, that will oversee the various aspects of the firm. Now, these managers are what we would call junior partners of the entrepreneur. That is, their very jobs and their bonuses depend on how well their departments or units do. What allows the, the entrepreneur to create a large firm, even though he can't be anywhere, everywhere, is the fact that we have double bookkeeping accounting. Okay? That is, that he can calculate costs and revenues for many different profit centers in the firm. So he can, he can oversee, or he can look at the, the books and see that certain managers aren't performing well, other managers are performing well. He can see whether or not I, can, I should actually shut down this branch of the firm or this unit or expand it. Okay? So the um, accounting, cost accounting, uh, capital accounting, allows the entrepreneur to watch and over, over, over the overall firm and to determine what managers are doing good jobs and what managers are not doing good jobs. If they're not doing good jobs, they either get no bonus or they, they, they can be fired. Okay. Now, so managers are junior partners of the entrepreneur. Okay. They try to keep costs down. They do want to earn profits for their departments and units and so on. They know that they'll, they'll get bonuses if they do so or they'll get, you, they'll get big raises. But why aren't they entrepreneurs? Even though they, they're going to share in the profits, because the higher the profits, the more their bonuses will be. So they, they will they'll get some share of the profits. The reason is very simple. Do they risk any capital? No, they don't risk any capital. They still get their basic wage, no matter how badly they do. Okay? They don't suffer a positive loss, okay? like the entrepreneur does. The worst that can happen to them is that their job can be terminated. So the managers, even the CEOs, are not entrepreneurs. Now the question becomes, who controls the corporate firm, these huge corporate firms? Okay. It used to be said in the 70s and 80s, um, well actually in the 60s and 70s, uh, there was an economist, a left-wing economist, John Kenneth Galbraith, who all the left-wing intellectuals, non-economists, um, believe was you know, the greatest economist uh, that, that, that ever lived. Okay. Um, my doctor used to always say, what do you think about Galbraith's new book? I didn't really. I wouldn't really tell him, you know, in, until he treated me. When I really thought of it, I, I sort of hem and haw, you know, until the treatment was complete. Um, but anyway, he he came up with this theory saying that the firm is not controlled by the owners. Stockholders, in many firms, are are small stockholders. They're dispersed. They have their own jobs. They're not paying attention to what's going on in, from a day on a day to day basis with the firm, and therefore the firm is controlled. He made up a word. He's always, he was always making up words by the technocracy, meaning the managers and the scientists and engineers. You know, the technical people and the managers. Okay. Well, let me give you an analogy to that. Let's say one of the Rockefellers, you know, a very rich family, has an estate in, up, in upstate New York, a big estate, and he hires a head gardener. And if you were to watch how the, the estate was landscaped, you would never see Rockefeller involved on a day-to-day -day basis. He's in New York you know, with his investment banking and so on, um, absorbed in, in those activities. So you would say, wow, th this head gardener is in control of everything. Okay? Anything that's planted on, 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 on the grounds, you know, any, any type of, um, of um, you know, new uh, shrubbery that's put in, so on and so forth. Uh, if there's a golf course, he's the one who takes care of it, he's the one who lays it out. All of those things are done by the head gardener or the head um, landscaper. Okay? But th would, anyone s would anyone deny that if one day Rockefeller came up there and, and looked around and said, this is terrible, you're fired. Okay? So even though he's not involved in, in the day-to-day -day, um, activity of, of, of laying out the, the way the estate looks, is he the ultimate decision maker? Of course he is, because he has the power to hire and fire. Well, that's certainly true even in large firms. Okay? There are a number of ways that, that stockholders, even small stockholders, can exercise control over what the managers do. Because remember, it's always in the manager's interest okay, 
the manager wants to do is to have a bigger office, big offices, plush carpets, expensive art hanging in his office and in, and, and in other areas of, of, of uh, um, the um, executive office suite. He wants expensive furniture. He wants access to a company helicopter so he can go to um, uh, his country club right away on Fridays. He wants um, not only a limousine to drive him from his home, but he wants a, another limousine to drive his kids to and from school. Well, he wants all of these things, right? And he's a CEO, and he can get these things, right? But what's to prevent... So managers always want to raise costs, including their own salaries. He also wants to hire more people that he doesn't really need, because the more people you hire, the bigger the firm becomes, and the more you'll get paid. He also wants to trade off, he might, he might hire three pretty secretaries at the expense of one secretary who's much more efficient and can do the job of the three, but it isn't as pretty. Okay, so he, he'll make all of these decisions that benefit him or her, if, if it's, a, it's a woman who's the CEO, personally. Okay, how do they stop that? How do, how do the stockholders stop that? Well, there's a number of ways to control that type of behavior. That type of behavior by managers um, is called an agency problem. They're the agent of the stockholders, but their interests are different from the stockholders. Stockholders want profits as high as possible. Okay? Managers want to raise costs in a way that benefits th themselves directly. So according to Galbraith, the technocracy made sure that the, the stockholders got some return, but they made decisions that benefited themselves. They made the firms grow too large. They made decisions that, um, you know, for, for having a fleet of jets when they really didn't need a whole fleet of jets to fly them around the country, and so on and so forth. Um, all right, well, different ways. I'll go through very quickly. Um, one is a proxy fight. Okay. If the board of directors, which is which are uh, supposedly responsible to the stockholders, is not controlling this type of managerial behavior, then some of the bigger stockholders in the company can call for a proxy fight, which is, which is to vote the old board of directors out and put in a new board of directors that will fire the managers and hire new managers that do a better job. Okay? And that's, that's one way of getting the managers out. Another way um, is just um, the board of directors themselves just firing the managers. Okay. But the most important way and the way that, can, that um, is even open to smaller stockholders is simply to sell stock. Okay? If you see the value of the stock going down, or if you believe that it's, the value of the stock is not going up quickly enough, given the resources that the firm has, you as a stockholder can sell the stock. Now, as more and more stockholders begin to sell their stock, what happens to the value of the firm? It begins to drop. So if the firm was initially worth $50 million, okay, that was the outstanding value of the stock, let's say, and it loses 20% because people are selling because they don't believe that, that, that the profits are being maximized and that they can do better things with their money, then this, it might fall to $40 billion. Now, what you might find then, okay, here's where the hostile mergers come in, which are great. Another entrepreneur, a Donald Trump, Trump type, or um, uh, you know, an entrepreneur who's in another line of business will say, wait a minute, or even the same line of business, with, with the assets this firm has, I can, I, can make, I, I can increase the income so much that the value of the stock will go up to, to $55 billion. So what will he do? He'll begin to, at $40 billion, say, this is a bargain. Okay, I'll bid 42 or $43 billion. I'll buy up all the stock, or 51% of the stock, I'll fire the management, you know, I pay $43 billion for all of this stock, and then I can eventually earn $13 billion more in profit. Okay, stock will shoot up because I'll put in better managers. So hostile takeovers are ways of protecting the small stockholders. Now, so, the re because, by the way, so the ma management teams of, of big corporations know about hostile takeovers, they don't even try to do those types of things. Okay? They're very careful about raising costs. They want to keep the costs low. They want higher um, um, stock prices. Because the lower the stock price, the more you are a target of a hostile merger. And when there's a hostile merger, that, the existing management team usually gets kicked out. Okay? They don't want that to happen. Now, there's another way of preventing 
um, th this agency problem, and that is make the CEO and the CFO and, and the top management make a large part of their salaries dependent on the value of, of the stock. How do you do that? You don't pay them in straight cash. You, you pay a large part of their salary in what? Stock options. So that is that you give them a right to buy the stock at a certain price. So if the price of the stock goes up, then they're going to earn a profit. So that's another way to, to rein in uh, the um, managers okay, and, and prevent them from raising costs and benefiting themselves at the expense of the stockholders. So even in the case of the corporate firm, it's ultimately the entrepreneurs, the investors, that, that control the firm. Okay. Uh, one last point I want to make. Um, it, it, there were a lot of hostile takeovers and mergers and so on. Um, actually, hostile takeovers okay, is, is the term. But in the late 1980s, and you used to see letters written into the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, and these letters would say, um, these hostile takeovers are preventing us from taking a long-term view like the Japanese managers do. Um, there's a, an emphasis on earning profits today. And so that as American corporations are less efficient for that reason. Okay. Now, who usually signed these letters? The CEOs of companies that were doing poorly and that were targets of hostile takeovers. Okay. Obviously, if you, the higher the profits that you earn today okay, and in the future, the higher the value of the firm is. The way to increase the value of the firm, the way to run the firm more efficiently, or the way that tells you that the firm is being run more efficiently, is to have a higher value of, of the firm today. Okay? That, that tells us that you're using the resources in the highest valued uses from the point of view of consumers. And in fact, we saw what happened to the Japanese model. Okay, by, by 1989, Japan went into a recession, or what's called a growth recession, that they still haven't emerged from. Okay? One of the problems, by the way, that the, 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 there was a crooked um, senator, unfortunately from New, my home state of New Jersey, his name was Harrison. He was crooked. He, he was caught in, uh, uh, what was it called, Arab scam. He was taking money from Arab sheiks and so on. Um, and he was also a, a drunkard and, and so on. And um, so just a, you know, a nasty guy. And, but, but he passed a piece of, his name is on a piece of legislation, he and someone else, the Harrison Something Act, that slows down or impedes the ability of more efficient entrepreneurs to take over firms. Because what they must do, they can't just come right in and buy a 51% of the stock. They can't do that. Okay? They have to give 30 days notice that they're going to start buying the stock up. And uh, during those 30 days, then the managers will try to, 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 to come up with all sorts of gimmicks to prevent them from taking over the firm. But the easier you make it for hostile takeovers to take place, the more managers will try to maximize profits. Okay, the more aware they will be of, of, of the price of their stock falling. And this benefits the small stockholders. Okay. Okay, now let's focus on, on what monetary profit is and what it implies for the market economy. Okay, let me take a very simple example because economists calculate profit and loss differently than accountants do. Um, so profit is defined as the difference between total revenue and total cost. And I'll use the Greek symbol pi for profit, because in economics we use P to represent price. Okay? So pi re represents economic profit, PR is total revenue, PC is total cost. And let me take a very, very simple example. Let's say that there's someone who starts a small landscaping firm, and that that person has out-of-pocket expenses of $100,000 okay, for the labor that he hires, for the, um, the tools that he, he purchases, um, for the shrubbery and, and grass seed and, and, and so on that he, he purchases. Okay, so his out-of-pocket expenses, the actual money, his own money savings that he invests is $100,000. And at the end of the year, um, let's say that his total revenue is $140,000. Now, forgetting about depreciation for a moment, an accountant would say, well, the net earnings or the, pro the accounting profit of the firm is $40,000. But an economist would want to know more. An economist wants to know, does the individual contribute any of his own resources okay, that he doesn't have to pay for directly to this firm? So let's assume that he, he manages the firm himself. Okay? Not only does he invest in it, but he is the on-site on manager. Well, you have to take that into account. In other words, 
how would you determine, you have, to, you have to account for the value of his managerial labor? Well, economists point out that you must include any foregone wages in t total costs. So let's say that he could, he could hire himself out to another small firm as a manager and earn $50,000 a year. Well then, that has to be included under total costs, even though he's not paying that out of his pocket. Okay. Um, he also, let's say, has a truck that he uses in his business. Okay, he owns the truck. He uses it in his business. Okay. Well, there's also a foregone rent. He could rent that truck out for the year or lease it out to someone. Let's say for five thousand dollars. That's the value of the service of the truck for the year. That has to be accounted for. And finally, he didn't borrow this money from a bank. He took it out of his own savings, which means that there's a foregone interest, right? He could have put it in a certificate of deposit, let's say, and let's, instead of well, the half a percent they're earning today, let's say he could have earned 10% for simplicity. Well, there's also a foregone interest on his own savings. 10% of 100,000 is 10,000. So what an economist would do would be to recalculate total costs, adding in what's called implicit, this is called implicit costs, and that's $65,000 more. So that this would be 165000 And in fact, if his total revenue at the end of the year was only 140000 he would actually have an economic loss of $25,000. Now, does that make sense to calculate it that way? It certainly does. Because think of it this way. Let's say he never started this business. At the end of the year, he would have had then $50,000 from wages that he earned. He would have had... $5,000 in rent, because he leased his truck out, and he would have had um, $10,000 in interest. Plus, he would have had the whole $100,000 in investment sitting in a certificate of deposit. So how much money would he have had at the end of the year if he didn't start the business? $165,000. But having started the, started the business, all he has at the end of the year is what? $140,000. The business was unsuccessful from the economic point of view, which means that he lost $25,000. Now, to break even, he would have to cover all of the implicit costs. So to break even, he would have to have revenues of at least $165,000, in which case he would, have, he would not have earned, it be one sixty-five, would not have earned any economic profit. Now, would he stay in business? Sure. You don't need a profit to stay in business because he would have been getting the normal rate of return on his, on his capital. He would have been getting 10%. So even if he's getting a zero profit, he is covering the, the foregone interest. Okay? So that's why firms who, who don't earn economic profit will stay in business. Okay? And, we'll, and I'll make use of that point in a moment. And I think it's pretty clear to you now that the entrepreneur certainly will benefit when there's a profit and, and, and suffer when there's a loss. But what about society? Okay? In other words, what are the social implications of entrepreneurs earning profit? This is an important question. Do profits, high profits in particular, really injure consumers? Do high profits mean high prices? Okay. Well, in fact, the, the answer is absolutely not. In fact, high profits means that resources that were previously being wasted are now being used in higher valued uses. Well, let me give you an example of that. A few years ago, um, There was a movie called The Blair Witch Project. It used unknown actors. Um, the total cost was something like $60,000. Okay. Now, there was a, an advertising campaign uh, that added a couple million dollars to that. But uh, the total cost of the, of the people initially invested in, in making the movie was $60,000. And that movie turned in um, or uh, t turned out revenues of more than, I think that was more than, I had it here, $125 million or something. Yeah. It went, to, it went to over $100 million. That was a huge profit for these people. Even given the fact they had, a, they had a, um, uh, add to a, a couple million dollars for advertising. It was a huge profit. Did that benefit or hurt consumers? 
Well, in fact, it benefited consumers. Now, how did it benefit consumers? Well, these people took the $60,000 worth, worth of resources, the labor, um, the um, camera, the uh, camera services, the film, um, whatever other costs were involved in putting this movie together. They took those resources, which other entrepreneurs were only willing to pay up to $60,000 for. That's why they had to get pay $60,000. They had to bid these resources away from other uses. The other uses, in total, was worth 60000 And they combined them into a product, this, this film, that consumers valued at $100 million. Okay? So, had they not intervened, had they not bought up those $60,000 worth of resources and made that movie, consumers would have only gotten from the same resources goods worth what? 60000 Now they got goods worth $100 million. Same thing is true with uh, the Passion of the, of, of, of the Christ, or Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson. He spent, I saw an interview with him, about $40 million of his own money. And that movie has gone um, to well over $250 um, million. Okay? Now, I think actually on worldwide distribution it's up to, it's up to um, half, a, half a billion dollars now. And when it comes to video, it'll even be more. He did the same thing took resources that were undervalued, were being used for projects that had a lower value to consumers, and turned them into something that had a much higher value to consumers. Okay? Uh, let me give you a, a very interesting example of another pro product, a very sort of an everyday product, that wound up turning a huge profit. Um, actually, women would know about this. I think most of the women in this class might know about this. It's called Topsy Tail. Okay, it was a way of quickly, I don't know, making braiding your hair or doing different things to your hair. Um, came out in, I think the night, late 1980s, I don't know, in the early 1990s. Okay, there was this woman, her name was Tamina, Tamima Edmark, and she was uh, worked for, for IBM in Dallas. Um, she was a mainframe saleswoman, good thing she got out. Um, and one day, uh, she believed that her, you know, she used to wear her hair a ponytail, and then she believed it looked a little drab. So she she suddenly came up with a device um, which consisted of a plastic loop and a, and a knitting needle, very simple device. And um, she used it very quickly to to redo her hair. And she then started thinking about it, and so she took five thousand dollars and patented it. Okay, paid for patent, for and, and she called it Topsy Tail. Um, then later on she she invested another nine thousand dollars of her savings in a mold, okay, to make this thing. Okay, she hired a plastics maker who would produce as many topsy tails as as she demanded for about fifty cents a piece. Okay, so um, then she began to advertise in hairstyling uh, magazines, and um, the first ad that she uh, in April nineteen ninety one brought in about orders worth about a thousand dollars. Okay, and and she would do this. She would. Uh, fill the orders at night, stuffing envelopes herself at her home after work. Um, by the end of 1991, she was selling 200 units a month at $10 a piece. So she's paid 50 cents and she's selling them at $10 a piece. But it's a small scale operation, only, only 200 a month. Um, she was on, in New York on business for IBM and she met the um, editor of, the Gla of Glamour magazine and um, she showed her the device and the woman featured it okay, in the February 1992 issue. Within three weeks, Ed Mark, the woman who, who designed this, had $100,000 worth of orders, okay, and had to use her cleaning lady to help her stuff 400 envelopes each week, so she's still doing it out of her house. Um, all right, a few weeks later, she got, got a big break. IBM eliminated her job, so she got fired. Oh, but she got laid off, actually. Um, <laughs> She said, it was really a load off my mind. Okay, she, she wanted to now work full time on expanding Topsy Tail. So she had a $25,000 retirement package. She took the money, she lived off the money while she went to other retailers directly and tried to sell them her product. Okay? And then one day, she finally found a TV products firm um, in New Jersey a new, uh, that made a, um, a, uh, a commercial for her. Okay? She paid them to make a commercial. They agreed to put together a two-minute commercial, all right, and to manage all uh, to manage the television marketing and print advertising and retail distribution for her. Um, 
And they just wanted her to appear in the commercial, which she did do. Okay. Okay, so on, on her own, she then sold about 250, when she was on her own selling them, okay, before the commercial, she sold about 250,000 Topsy Tails at $10 a piece in 20 months. Okay, so she, she did pretty well because she was only paying 50 cents a piece to have them made. But in the first six, so that, that took her about 20 months to sell 250,000. Then in the first six months after commercial hit the networks in December of 1992, this two-minute commercial, um, she sold 3.6 million at $15. Okay, so now she's a multimillionaire. She sells $15, okay, price minus the average cost, 50 cents. <laughs> okay. She's making huge profits. Okay. Um, then, then she went on QVC Network in March, and she sold five thousand to fifteen dollars in eleven minutes. Okay. So the, now she now her biggest problem back in the early nineties was, was fighting these knockoff artists. She was trying to sue them and so on. By the end, she had the price. She had the cost down to twenty two cents. Okay, the average cost. And she was selling them at, at, as I said, $15. Now, the point is, did she benefit consumers? Yeah, because she took something, these, these very simple plastic and, and a needle, that was worth $0.22 cents to consumers. She turned it into a wholly new product that was valued by consumers at $15. So it was not only a boon to her, okay, not only was it a, a you know, huge profit for her, a windfall for her, but it was also windfall for consumers that, that place such a high value on it. Okay? Now the question becomes, well, you know, and, and, and I could go on and on giving you different examples of, of, of these, you know, about three years ago they began to um, uh, make blended uh, or flavored malted beverages like Mark, Mike's Hard Lemonade, that was the first one to come out. Um, consumers liked this, this, this alcoholic beverage in the summer, it was very refreshing and so on. And they were earning, you know, they were selling at six or seven dollars per six pack, you know, and, and, and you know, they're earning big profits, the, the, the producers. What quickly happened within, within, within months, actually? All these other companies began marketing flavored malted beverages. And, 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 and every summer, so I, 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 I like them, so I check them out. There's new ones coming out, okay? New and different kinds coming out, okay? By all these big companies. And the prices have been falling. So that's the other point I want to make. Even if you do make high profits for a while with the new product, it lures other entrepreneurs in, increases supply, lowers the price. Okay? So it's an entrepreneurial process. Just because you're making, you have a good idea and you've marketed this idea in a good way, it does not mean that you can continue to earn high profit. And in fact, if you take some uh, um, historical examples, when the first Electronic hand calculator came out. You may, you, you're too young to remember. Many of you are. I remember it was 1970 or so. I think it was Texas Instruments. It was 350 dollars. Okay. So let's say the cost was I don't know 100 dollars or something like that. Okay. Well, pretty quickly, more and more companies began to produce these these this product. So by the mid 70s, you know, the price had fallen under 100 dollars, and then prices continued to plummet until today. Okay. Prices are something like you know. For one that is even more sophisticated, you know, these could barely uh, divide and multiply. Okay, um, now you have, you know, you can get ones for five and ten dollars that are much more sophisticated than the, the earlier ones. Same thing with PCs. Okay, it started out twenty thousand dollars or more when they first came out um, in nineteen eighty or so. Now the prices are under a thousand dollars. You get you can get PCs for five hundred dollars that are much more powerful than the first ones that came out. Have much more memory and so on. So, not only do you, now, how does, let's assume for a moment that prices are pushed down to, to for hand calculators, let's continue to use that example. Prices are pushed down to $100, okay? So you have your price, you have your average cost, economic profit is zero, okay? Under these conditions, how do firms continue to earn profits? They're still earning a, a rate of return on their capital investment, so they stay in the market, okay? Well, there's another way to earn profits. You don't just have to have new ideas. You have to have uh, or ideas for new products. The other way to earn profits is to lower your costs, okay? To continually lower your costs. And because of the microchip revolution that began in the 1970s, firms adapted this new technology to commercial purposes and continually lowered 
the cost. So one firm might come out with a new technology that lowered the cost to sixty-five dollars for producing a hand calculator, and, was, and then they could cut their price to ninety and still undercut their competitors who are selling for a hundred, as well as earn a profit because the cost is only sixty-five dollars per unit. Um, but the competitors would quickly realize that they're going to be losing ten dollars because they have to cut their price to ninety-two. And now they're losing ten. They're going to have to implement the new technology. So this pressure to continually lower cost is also a source of new profit because the first firms that lower costs, at least for a while, earns profits. Um, the other historical example I, I, I brought, um, I want to bring to your attention actually, has to do with the ballpoint pen pit business. A ball, there were no ballpoint pens until the mid 1940s. Okay, there were only these. Um, um, I guess fountain pens, you know, which used to, which I remember using for when I first started to write when I was, you know, in first grade or something like that. They're horribly messy and, you know, very hard, especially for kids to fill it with ink and it'll get all over you. Um, they're just basically annoying. Uh, but anyway, um, in 1945, there's a company called Milton Reynolds, and it patented a new type of pen with a ball bearing, okay, rather than the conventional nib that you have on the, um, the fountain pen. And, um, just to give you an idea of how prices fell, when this pen was introduced by Gimbel's, okay, they sold it to Gimbel's, which was the big competitor of Macy's in New York City, um, they introduced the pen at twelve dollars and fifty cents. Now that's in nineteen forty-five dollars, okay. So the price level has gone up maybe five times more, six, seven times since then. So it's well over a hundred dollars in today's dollars. It was like a luxury item, like a BMW. Okay, you you'd leave it out on your your coffee table if you had people over to show how you know how well off you were. Okay, you have your fountain, the um, ballpoint pen sitting there. Um, anyway, Macy's, who was a competitor of Gimbel's, then introduced an imported pen and began to sell it for nineteen dollars and ninety-eight cents. And then in April, EverSharp uh, introduced uh, a model at fifteen dollars. And then Schaefer introduced another pen at um, fifteen dollars. Okay, Reynolds, which introduced the, the, the first model, then cut its price at twelve fifty. Okay, so now they're selling at twelve fifty. And the average cost is sixty cents. Okay, so there's huge profits being made in the ballpoint pen industry in 1945. Um, and then very quickly, uh, there was a um, more companies came in. Just to, to give you the, the the figures, there was a ballpoint pen company of Hollywood introduced the 995 model. Okay, in October. Now we're about a year later from when the first pen was introduced. Reynolds came up with a new model at three three eighty five. Okay, they were the first ones to introduce it. So now they're down to 385, and um, the cost is now 30 cents. They've cut the cost to 30 cents, still earning huge profits. Um, by, 19, by December of 1946, about a year, about 14 months after the first ones were introduced, there were 100 manufacturers, okay, in 14 months. 100 manufacturers had already been co come in moored by the high profits, okay, and um, ballpoint pens are now selling for 298, still a, you know, huge, a very high price. Okay, for pens. But by February 1947, Gimbel's was selling a pen manufactured by the Continental Pen Company, and they priced it at 98 cents. Reynolds then um, came up with another model, and it, which was being sold for 88 cents. Okay. Anyway, by mid 1948, ballpoint pens were selling for 39 cents, and uh, they had gotten the cost down to 10 cents. So they're still earning huge profits. Okay. Well, that's what happens in all markets in the economy. Thank you. That's what happens in all, all markets in the economy. Entrepreneurs that are successful can't stand on their success. They can't say, aha, I have a successful product. I'm not going to change it. I'm going to continue to produce this product. Why? Because other entrepreneurs will duplicate their product. Not only that, they may make, come up with a, a better product, a better quality product, at a lower cost. So this benefits consumers, this, um, this selective process. Okay? It continually not only pushes down costs, but as costs fall, it means profits get bigger. So just as you're pushing down costs to get bigger profits, what's happening? More entrepreneurs are coming in because of the bigger profits, pushing down prices. And that's what happened to PCs. That's why PCs started out at 20,000 and came all the way down to 500. Costs kept falling as, as firms competed with one another to lower costs so that they could expand their profit margins. Okay? That happens continually in every market in the economy. That's why the natural um, development of a market economy is to have continually falling prices. Okay, we do see that in the high tech industries, right? 
DVDs, iPods, all the, all the electronic equipment, all sorts of software, all those things come down in price because technology has improved so much. However, why do the prices of automobiles still go up? Why do the prices of men's suits still go up? Why do the prices of hamburgers still go up? All of these things should be coming down in price. The reason is we have, which is another, another lecture in itself, the Federal Reserve System keeps pumping new money into the system. Okay? When the American economy was growing, uh, industrializing, after the Civil War, there was a tremendous amount of growth from 1880 uh, to, to 1900. When, when the U.S. economy is industrializing. Prices were falling every year. Prices of everything was falling by 2 or 3% per year. And the economy is growing tremendously. If the Federal Reserve wasn't continually increasing the money supply, prices would continue to fall. Okay? Uh, an, a mass-produced automobile in, 19, uh, in 1914, after Ford introduced um, the assembly line, was something like, I don't know, I think it was $360. Okay? Um, why is the price of a family owner, and, and the middle class was now beginning to buy it? Why is the price of it twenty thousand dollars today? Okay, well, there's been quality improvements. That's one reason why the price is higher. Okay, but the prices should be lower, not higher, because we have so many more automobiles today. The supply has increased so much. Well, why has the money demand increased so much? Because the Fed has pumped in new money. It's only in those industries where technology and has improved tremendously and capital investment has increased so that their supplies have increased more than the supply of money, as in PCs, hand calculators, that you get falling prices. But that should show us that that's what should happen throughout the economy, okay, as a result of entrepreneurial competition. Okay. Um, let me just say, I have like three minutes left. Let me just say a few other words of, of, about profits. Profits do tend to disappear. They tend to go to zero, okay, because of, of, of our new entrepreneurs coming in and, and competing. However, profits never totally disappear from the economy, okay? There's always profits in the economy. There's always losses in the economy. Losses also tend to disappear because companies that are losing money tend to go out of business and other companies tend to shrink and produce less of the good that's losing money. Why then do we not have zero profits in the American economy? or in any economy. The reason is people's tastes continue to change. So they have new tastes you know, for low-carb food. Suddenly the people that are marketing low-carb foods are earning high profits. And people that are, that are, that are marketing um, low-fat foods but are high in sugar content and carbs are now losing money, whereas a few years ago they're making money. Technology changes. That introduces new products, uh, new, new profits. And uh, resources change. Price of gasoline goes up. So therefore, the, um, the, the cost of running an automobile goes up, so, uh, so there's losses on certain type of cars that are gas guzzling cars and so on. Well, you get the idea. Um, the other point I want to make, so, so the source of new profits is uncertainty and change. It's a continual change in economic data. People's tastes, resources, and technology. That's the source of profit, okay? If everyone exactly knew what the price is, Every entrepreneur knew exactly what the price of all consumers' goods would be in the future, then it would be no different than me standing up here, I don't have it with me, but having a $20 bill and saying, I will give you this $20 bill and you trust me, okay? Okay, let's assume I'm not from New Jersey and my, my name doesn't end with a vowel. Okay, so you trust me completely and I'm going to give you the $20. Um, how much would you, would, 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 you know, let's say I auctioned it off to this class. How much would, would, would the price of that $20 be? be about $20 minus the interest rate because you get it one year from now. That's what, what always is tending to happen in the market economy. Okay? But things are changing, so people do not know what the prices of, of consumer goods will be in the future because they're always changing, demands and supplies and so on. So uh, bottom line is that, as I said, uncertainty is a source of profit. The last thing I want to say about profit, people think that profits are normal. Okay? People say, oh, he's earning a normal profit. But if profits are very high, they say there's something going on here. This firm is gouging consumers. But profits are very high, not because the firm is gouging consumers, but in the case of Topsy Tail, in the case of the Blair Witch Project, why are they earn those massive profits? They earn those profits because there was a maladjustment in production. There was not enough of these, this, this type of hair care product. There was not enough of, of, of these, this, this sort of independent scary movie. So what happened was people took lower valued resources and used them to produce goods that consumers valued at a very, very high uh, value. So 
Austrians would say that profits show that there was a maladjustment in production. The wrong things are being produced. But at the same time, the person who's earning profit is beginning to clear up that maladjustment. They're beginning to produce the things that consumers value more. Eventually, other entrepreneurs will follow and the profits will disappear. Okay? So profits don't result from monopoly. They don't result from price gouging. Free market profits result from making a product that is better than is currently out there from the point of view of consumers. So I'll stop there. Thank you.